Mr. Meikner? Point over his shoulder. Through your hair here, you want to pull it to the side for me? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Great. And if you can put that uh, mic cord back on under again, please. Yes, absolutely. Sorry. Okay, I just want you to be aware that the doors are locked. Lean and up. If anyone needs to leave, it makes a noise. Go ahead, lean back. So if you need to leave for any reason, if you want to stop, because I don't know if you want that noise in the background of the sliding doors opening up. It's okay. pretty heavy and mechanical. We we'll, go, we'll go straight through here. Everybody's good? Joe has a lighting one. Does the lighting look up again? I'm going to line. Okay. Do it nice. They've got you lit really well. Hmm? They've got you lit really well. Remember, waist up, no stripes. Yep. Either one of you guys. Yeah. We good? Good to go. Good. Okay. Um, just a couple of minutes ago, you heard the verdict from the jury. What are your thoughts? Um, I think I just went blank. Just, um, I don't know. I just feel overwhelmed. I think I just need to take it a day at a time. Was it unexpected, do you think, this verdict? It was unexpected for me, yes, because there was no premeditation on my part. I can see how things look that way, but... I didn't expect the premeditation. I could see maybe the felony murder because of how the law is written, but I didn't ex the whole time I was fairly confident I wouldn't get the premeditation because there was no premeditation. It seemed, and you got a lot of questions from the jury, it seemed like some of those jurors didn't believe what you were telling them, didn't believe your story. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts yeah. on that? I can understand that, I think, because of what I was, the lies that I told in the beginning to try to cover up this, cover up that, hide things that I didn't want to be known, made public. Why did you lie at the beginning? Um, well, mostly because I was scared, but I also didn't want certain aspects of my relationship with Travis to come out. And um, I was ashamed of what had happened, how it happened, how it escalated. Um, I don't know if there's really a word in, at least in my vocabulary to describe it, but I think mortified is one of the closest words, ashamed, things like that. You, um, did you avoid eye contact with Travis's family while you were in there, or did you make eye contact, and what are your thoughts on that? Um, I typically avoided eye contact. Travis comes from a family where they all sort of look a lot alike, so when I see their faces, I see Travis, and I see the man that abused me, and I don't want to look at that. Um, is it hard? Do you have a sense of where the, the public feeling is about you, that you're liked or not liked? I mean, I get the sense that there is great division on both sides, but I believe the majority is against me. So, what are your thoughts on that? Um, A psychologist once explained to me that society has this need to um, persecute people. They get some sort of gratification from it, so there might be something going on there. Um, beside that, I, I don't really, it's so convoluted that we could talk for hours on that, but 
um, it just is what it is. You, um, in just a recent, we'll talk about Twitter in a second, but in just a recent tweet you were talking about, you just mentioned the word suicide. I mean, how are you feeling right now? Well, I'm not really looking forward to what comes next, but. Explain that to me. Um, well, I just, it's just more court. It just keeps going on and on. I just want, wanted to get it over with. Are you focusing on the court, or are you focusing on what could be the, the worst outcome for you? Well, the worst outcome for me would be natural life. I would much rather die a lot sooner than later. Longevity runs in my family, and I don't want to spend the rest of my natural life in one place. Um, you know, I'm pretty healthy. I don't smoke, and I would probably live a long time. So that's not something I'm looking forward to. Um, I said years ago that I'd rather get death than life, and that still is true today. I believe death is the ultimate freedom, so I'd rather just have my freedom soon, as soon as I can get it. So you're saying you actually prefer getting the death penalty to being in prison for life? Yes. That might surprise some people. Well, I think that if you look at um, things eternally, it's not as scary. I mean, we do get attached to our lives, and I'm attached to mine. But um, I don't know. I just I can't fathom staying in one spot for the rest of my life. So I've been everywhere. And um, I think it would just drive me a little crazy. You uh, had some clashes with Juan Martinez. You kind of went after him on Twitter a little bit. What are your thoughts on Juan? Um, well... Prior to trial, I respected Juan as a very um, capable attorney, um, even though he's done some very shady things in my case, as far as hiding evidence and um, failing to disclose certain things, hoping it would just go away. But in the end, what does it matter? It didn't help my case, as far as all the evidence that did come to light eventually. Um, in trial, I think that um, his accusation that I was seeking fame is, is absurd. Um, I remember a hearing we had in 2011 when he stood up before the court and said, I don't control the media. If, if it were up to me, I'd be on TV every night. So I think he's the one seeking fame, not me. But, you know, it is what it is. You... Uh had some, some pretty tough things, I would imagine, to go through in the trial. During the trial, there were photographs of you displayed. Uh, I noticed you tended to look away. What were you thinking when those photographs were being flashed up in front of everybody? I wanted to crawl under the table and just disappear. If you had to look at some of the tougher uh, parts of what you've been through the last four months, what would they be? Just coming to fully understand what I've put people through, my family and everyone else as well. That's the part I'll always regret. Well, just the way everything happened, um, I think that if I had just been honest from the beginning, I'd be in a different place. And so would everyone else. And um, because of what I've done, a lot of people will hurt for a long time. It's got to be a tough uh, time for you, obviously, just learning what happened telling me that if you had done things differently, do you, do you regret how you went about doing things after Travis was killed, after you killed Travis? Yeah, I think that I was just freaked out. Well, I know I was freaked out. Um, I didn't know what to do. I, did, I knew that I couldn't just carry on as normal, but I tried to do that. I tried to act that part until, you know, until everything came down on me. 
I just, I just couldn't imagine going to my family and saying, hey, look what happened, or going to the police and saying, here, arrest me. Um, I was just horrified with what had happened, and it was difficult to face that that I had been pushed to that point and that I would, could be capable of something like that. And let's talk a little bit about what happened um, after you and Travis's that night and that day. A lot of people who have talked to me about it have said, how could she have gone up and been with another man you know, basically 24 hours after this? How were you able to put that behind you and basically go on a date? I don't think I so much put it behind me as I just sort of checked out. I hardly remember that day. Um, I don't remember it being nearly as intimate as he described. I remember falling asleep and taking a nap, and he was lying next to me. Um, I remember feeling, it's strange, but I remember feeling safe. He wasn't going to snap. He wasn't going to, you know, take advantage of me and try to do things I wasn't comfortable with. Um, I just felt safe with that person, but... I knew that, I mean, it's not like I went up there because I was hoping to pursue a relationship. I went up there because I thought, oh crap, I need to keep my schedule. So I went up there almost because I felt a sense of obligation inside in order to keep up the pretense, not because I was going off to have fun. But it's odd even to me, I don't know you at all, but I, I feel like I know a little bit about you. But you really you look at your hands and you realize what's happened. Yeah. And at that point, you say to yourself, I've got to go up and meet this person. I'm going to keep that appointment. I'm going to keep that date. How do, I don't understand how that goes through your mind. Well, how? what happened was um, I slowly began to come to while I was in the desert. And um, um, when I found my charger and I turned my phone on, there were tons of voicemails. Um, one from Leslie, I think a few from Leslie maybe one from Ryan. And I realized these people are wondering where I am. And I thought, I just felt like I needed to buy myself some time and figure out what had happened. I was just very, I was very shocked. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I'd like to go over just a couple of things in the case, if I could. Um, when your grandparents' gun went missing, that's what most people point to as the point where you basically made the decision that I'm going to go down there and do this. What, what do you say to people when they make that point? Well, I was really hoping the defense would call my sister because I spent the day with her. And um, we weren't at the house when that happened. We weren't even in Wairika. We were out of town. We were um, actually in no town. We were out in the middle of almost nowhere at a Buddhist monastery near the border of Oregon and California taking pictures. I was really hoping my defense team would... Um, recover those pictures. They're on another hard drive that stopped working that they never made an issue of. Those photos on there um, are date and time stamped and they show that I'm out of town um, during that time. So that was my hope that we could show the jury that I was nowhere near that area. I mean, that's what it's really helpful. So you're sticking by that part of your story? Oh, sure. absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk about the gas cans. That's another thing that keeps being brought up all the time. Was there a third gas can? Um, there was initially when I purchased it, right. but I, I really did return it. I got $13 and change back, and I went on my way. A lot of people are saying, who, who carries gas in the trunk of their car? I didn't fill it up until I realized I was going to be driving across the desert um, on a highway alone that I've never driven at night. And um, it's something that we began to do when I moved to the desert because we didn't want to get stranded somewhere. Um, just being from the coast, 120 degrees is a, a shock to your system. So we sort of um, would travel with provisions and things like that. So not always gas, but I was taking a road that I'd never traveled before. And um, suddenly being safe was more important than saving a few dollars on gas, which was my initial goal. And the, the other thing that keeps coming up, or the jury seemed to have issues with as well, was the lack of memory over the attack. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain that to me? Sure. Um, I think it's been described how certain memories come back with time and rather than get worse. And I've experienced a little bit of both. Memories have come back. It's not just completely blank. Little things have come back here and there that I remember. Have, have, have things come back since we began talking about this, since the trial started? Um, no, these things, well, 
I can't think of anything specifically. These things have come back within the last year, two years. Things have been popping up and coming back, and I testified to that a little bit. Um, just different scenarios that have research. I don't want to get into the details. Um, so I, I just, I can't explain it. I think I have a good memory, and it's almost like I blacked out, but I mean, obviously wasn't unconscious. Um, you're talking about your defense a little bit, and you wish they would have done this and done that. Are you happy with your defense? I'm grateful for my defense. They've worked very hard. Um, not 100%, but they've worked very hard. What would you have changed? Um, there is a man who saw me with bruises all over. I would have made every effort to find him, and they didn't. There are other people who saw me with bruises. Um, my friends, my sisters, and the defense didn't call them for their own reasons, and I think that that would have cooperated some of the things that I said. On the hard drive that we just discussed, um, the one that was not part of my trial, there are photographs during that time, and I think there might have been a photograph on there. Maybe, maybe not. We wouldn't know unless we looked. Oh, but like your bruises or something? Yeah. I took pictures of myself during that time, not specifically for that purpose, but just being on the road. And I just keep thinking maybe it was in that photo. Um, tons of things. You know, um, what I hear from women a lot is if she was getting beat up, why didn't she call the police? That's probably what you hear them? from women who have not been in my situation and been abused. Um, I think at that time, if I can put myself back in that mind frame at that time, my fear of calling the police is that I would be seen as overly dramatic or I would make an enemy of Travis and I really just wanted us to be able to be friends ultimately. Um, I was scared of the consequences for him and scared a little bit for me of calling the police and getting them involved, getting the law involved. And um, I didn't want that to happen to him. I, I just wanted him to go on and be happy and be successful, and I wanted the same for myself. Um, let's talk about your family for a, a little bit. Your mom has been um, there for you every day in the courtroom. What are your thoughts on her? my mom and my whole family. Yeah, that's difficult. As far as my mom, I feel like I don't deserve her. She's been a saint, and I've not treated her very well. There was some talk about you getting physical with your mother. Did that happen in terms of fighting and things like that? Um, I vaguely remember the incident, I think, when they say I kicked her. We were arguing and she was kicking me under the table, and I think I kicked her back. I was a teenager. She did anything she could to keep us under control. So. She uh, visits you often. What do you talk about? Um, everything, pretty much. Sometimes they're good visits, sometimes they're bad visits. Or unpleasant. Other times they're great. So. What happens during the good visits? Um, usually she's telling me um, stories about things that are happening with my family or my friends or how many um, emails and messages of support that she's getting people that support my family and me. 
you know, moral support that they're behind us, and that makes me feel good. What about the, what about the bad visits? What are they like? They're usually um, just discussing unpleasant things, um, frustrating times. Things are very frustrating sometimes, and it just, it's a drag. Um, your artwork is all over the place. Do you take uh, pride in the fact that people are paying money for your art? Um, it's interesting. Um, I take pride just not so much in the price tag, but in the way I've developed the gift itself, or the talent, I should say. I take pride in that, and I'm just, I'm happy that I'm able to share it with the world. Um, I noticed that, um, and I saw this on another network, so I, I don't know 100% if it's correct, but uh, that you buy large amounts from the commissary, and then you tweeted out that you, it's not only for you. Tell me about what you do behind bars when you come to the commissary. Yeah, um, after I was arrested, I'm no longer working or going to church, and so I'm not tithing anymore to the church. But the church encourages you to tithe 10%, so what I do is I take 10% of the dollar amount that I spend and I give that away. And then recently I've been blessed with the ability to spend a little bit more, so I'm able to give more. And I've, I've been glad to be able to do that. Are you still practicing your faith? Um, I don't think I... I'm still a member of the LDS Church, but I'm not actively practicing my faith at this point. Um, they don't offer LDS services for maximum security inmates, and the Mormons rarely come around to visit me. So I've sort of fallen away for that. I don't know. I still have my scripture. I still read it. But it's hard to maintain um, an active status in the church when you're sort of cut off from it. You say the Mormons don't come around to visit you. Who are you talking about? Um, they have... Well, they do come, but maybe like once or twice a year. Um, they are volunteers that are members of the church that go to jails, prisons, um, facilities where people are incarcerated to visit them. The uh, Alexander family, uh, especially the, the two sisters uh, and the younger brother, if you could say something to them, what would you like to say to them? I hope that now that a verdict has been rendered that they're able to find peace, some sense of peace. I don't think they'll ever find the peace that they would like, but maybe, they, maybe they'll be able to have greater peace now or some semblance of it and be able to move on with their lives and remember their brother the way they wanted to. Do you still think about Travis? Yes. In what way? Um, there's a lot of regret because I was really hoping to get a plea and avoid talking about all of the things that came out about him. Um, if we had been able to avoid trial, we could have avoided just the murkier aspects of his life that he kept hidden. And these aren't just things that came from my mouth. They're his own words, his own emails, his own text messages. The activities that he was up to, photographs that show that as well. None of that ever would have come to light. It would have just been forgotten, and he would be memorialized as um, not perfect by any means, but somebody who was known to adhere to his morals and the principles that he espoused, but now the curtain has been drawn and you can see the hypocrisy and everything that was there and I regret that because I know that even though he was living the life of a hypocrite, that's not how he wanted to be perceived and I think inside he really didn't want to live that kind of life. There were some parts of your story that were definitely backed up by emails and texts and phone conversations and things like that but a lot of people had really
issues with the pedophilia when that was brought up. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, again, I mean, he's fantasizing about having sex with a 12-year-old on the tape. That's a pedophile by definition. Um, also, there's a photograph on my hard drive which my attorneys didn't feel was relevant, but it's a picture of him chasing around a naked four-year-old boy with his Bible open, pretending to be a Catholic priest. I don't know why we were all hanging out. I thought it was silly at the time, and I snapped the photograph. And um, at the time, I just thought he was mocking the Catholic Church in poor taste, and and then that was that. But that was a year before I walked in on him. And so after that incident of walking in on him, I began to put all these things together, and that was one of the puzzle pieces that seemed to make sense to me. A lot of people accusing you of tearing down a dead man's reputation. I would have been very happy to remain silent and go quietly into the night off to prison. My defense team decided to rip the lid off because we were forced to trial. Um, the state didn't want to settle, so it's not that I wanted to plow ahead and do this, but I took the stand because strategically they advised me to, and when I was on the stand, I had to tell, I had to answer the questions that were posed to me. So if you had to do this all over again, you're in the desert, you notice that you've got blood on your hands, how do you handle it? I would turn around and drive to the Mesa Police Department. And what do you think would have happened to you then? I don't know, but it would have been the right thing. Let's go forward. Say you do get a long sentence. How are you going to spend your life? I haven't decided yet. Talk to me again, if you can, briefly about wanting to hurt yourself. Do you feel like you want to hurt yourself right now? Not right now. I think I've gone in and out of periods of that since 2007. There was some talk about me being uh, suicidal in high school. I never was. I think I might have written the words, something along the lines of wanting to die, but that's distinctly different from wanting to actually kill myself. So I never was. It, I found it strange at the time that after I had gotten into the church and I gained a testimony of the church, suddenly I'm feeling suicidal. I didn't understand that. But I never did anything, so it could just be talk. It could just be purging my thoughts, um, that kind of thing. Um, you're tweeting. Talking about Twitter. Is that your idea? Um, initially... I've never been on Twitter. I don't even know what it looks like. I just have heard about it through other people reading about it in magazines. Um, in 2009, somebody started a false Twitter account in my name and began tweeting, pretending they were me. So I had that shut down. Um, and then it, it just became sort of an idea that I thought of in February, and we decided to go for it. Are you happy you have? Yes. Well, I, don't, I wouldn't say happy. I'm, I don't regret it. Right. Yeah. What has it brought to you? Um, I think there's a little bit of satisfaction gained from being able to um, just impart my ideas and my thoughts and sort of let people know where I'm coming from. Whoever wants to look, I mean, you don't have to read it if you don't like it. So, uh, you went after Nancy Grace there a couple times. Yeah. You want to talk about Nancy? I don't think she's worth it. Juan, you also went after there. Yeah, I just found it a very highly hypocritical that he would point to me and call me the epitome of a liar when he has lied over and over on record in court over the years. Um, I wish I had the ability to comb through those records and say, right here he lied, right here he lied, right here he lied, but he's not the one on trial. 
So in that sense, it doesn't matter that he lied. But in another sense, it does because of the important position that he has. Uh, we have, how am I doing on time, Lisa? Okay. Um, you've got a mitigation hearing coming up here or at, at, at penalty phase. Tell me what, do you know what your mitigating factors are going to be? And how you're going to um, Well, I've been told that I don't have any mitigating factors. By who? Um, my attorney. So Kirk Nurmi you're talking about? Kirk Nurmi said to you there are no mitigating factors for you in terms of arguing against the death penalty. Um, nothing that is what you typically see in a case like this, such as um, a childhood where there was drugs, alcoholism, molestation, things like that. None of those things occurred in my family. Um, so, I don't know. I guess we would sort of joke that my mom didn't beat me hard enough, so I don't really have mitigation. So what are you going to do? I talked to the attorney and, the, and who's handling it. Um, she seems like a very pleasant woman. She says she's got a week-long case. Well, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that um, they feel that I would be a suitable candidate to behave myself in um, a correctional facility and just not be a problem. That may be their angle. I don't know. Did you uh, have any knowledge of you know, the interest in your case? Do you have an idea of how many people are interested? Um, I hear things but I have no access to the news, the internet, that sort of thing. No direct access. What kinds of things do you hear? Um, I do get the newspaper, so that's been one portal where I've learned things. Um, a lot of inmates have come in to the jail since then, and they tell me um, they want to come up and shake my hand. They want to give me a hug. They want, to, they want my autograph. I'm not going to sign anything. They just... They want a piece of something that, so it's it's kind of strange, but that's given me an idea. That has to be strange, huh? Mm -hmm. what, what do you think when somebody comes up and asks you for your autograph? Um, it's in, it's kind of awkward. I mean, I, I want to be nice to people, but I tell them no. It's I don't think it's appropriate. Why don't you sign things? Um, my goal isn't fame. I just, my goal was just to get through this. So I certainly didn't want that to, to give off that impression. Pretty, uh, a quote or a sound bite from your trial that's played over and over again. And you even smiled at it in court. It was Kirk Nurmi saying nine days out of 10, mm -hmm. even he doesn't like you. Yeah. What did you think when he said that? Um, I thought of, um, I actually thought of Elizabeth Johnson's trial because I was reading the coverage in the paper and her attorney said, told the jury that it's important, uh, well, I'm paraphrasing, but he told them that it's not about whether or not you like her, it's about the facts of the case. So I think it was, um, I think it might, I believe it's standard somewhat that um, jurors need to remember it's not about whether or not you like the defendant. Um, Does Kirk like you? I think nine days out of ten. I mean, one day out of, day out of ten, nine. Of one day out of ten. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Why don't you get along? Well, we actually we got along very well for a long time, and then we just have had clashes um, in ideas, and ultimately he's the boss. Anything you want to say to Juan Martinez? No. Um, you seem to be writing quite a bit during testimony. What were you drawing? What were you doing? I was writing. Just thoughts. When I heard something with testimony, I would write notes, pass it to Jennifer, pass it to Kirk, things like that, just to keep them informed. So you um, were drawing? There might be occasional little scribbles in the margins, but no, no drawing. Anything else you want to talk about? Not that I can think of.
Well, actually, there is one more thing yes. I wanted to say. Um, if I could um, tell somebody in a situation that I was in anything, I just would encourage them to document it. I think that um, it doesn't mean they have to turn the person in or betray them, but should a situation ever arise, I think documentation would have been very helpful in my case. And um, my sister is going through um, something right now with her ex-husband, and there are um, a lot of things that she could have documented that would help her. So it surprises me that even as she knows about what I've gone through, she still fails to document these things. And it's so easy. Save these text messages, save these incidents, write these things down, make reports. Um, but they don't. People just don't do that. I don't know why women don't do that. I mean, some do. No, it's not black and white. It's not 100%. But if we could just make a record, then that record will stand should something happen down the line. You've actually started, um, at least uh, you tweeted out that you're selling T-shirts for a domestic violence shelter. Do you plan to continue those efforts? Yes. Why do you do that? Um, my... Uh, well, I, I assumed that they were doing okay as is with government funding and things like that, just donations, but I've spoken with some people who have worked in those shelters and they always need donations. And um, it's important to me to be able to assist them in being able to assist survivors. So I guess I'll wrap it up by saying, you talked about domestic violence. Um, a lot of people are gonna be, gonna be, a lot of people are gonna be seeing this. Is there one thing you'd like to get out to all those people? Do you mean um, people in general? Yes. I'm sure I'll think of something very clever to say later. But <laughs> As you walk out, yeah. you can understand that. I guess what I really want to say is to um, other women who are in a situation that I was once in. And it's like I just, like I just said, I really just, I wish they would just document it. That's it. You don't have to do anything with it. You don't have to turn the person you love in. You don't have to do anything. Just document it, just in case. It's better to have it and not need it than the opposite. And um, again, I think that things would be very different right now if I had documented all of the things that I went through instead of being in a state of denial. What would you like to say to all the people who seem to really dislike you, even, even hate you? Um... Well, maybe I should be flattered that they focus on me so much. If they dislike me so much, then why am I always on their radar? I'm Ivan, by the way. I'm Troy's executive producer. Thank you for doing this. Um, do you, you were just talking about people that don't like you. Mm -hmm. Do you care at all? I mean, does it matter to you that people like you or don't like you? Is it going to matter to you wherever you end up, if you went answer correctly? Um, at age 32, it doesn't matter. Um, I think when I was arrested at age 28, it bothered me. And um, even before my arrest, before I ever imagined my life going in this direction, if I knew someone didn't like me, it, it would gnaw at me in the back of my mind. But at this point, I can truly say it's like water off a duck's back. Um, I've reached a place. I wish I'd reached this place years ago, but I think it just comes with age. But I've reached a place where it, it really doesn't bother me. What about the domestic violence? groups that don't believe your story and say, we don't want your help. There's some people out there saying that, you know, keep your t-shirts, keep your efforts, we don't believe you. Okay. I'm not aware of um, any organizations that help survivors of domestic violence that are calling a survivor of domestic violence, um, saying that they don't believe that person. That's, um, that's not a good thing to say to somebody who's been through, through it. Um, it would be like a child running and telling somebody what's going on with them, and the parent says, I don't believe you, or an authority figure says, I don't believe you. So you can imagine what it does to that person. Um, and then I have a question about the jury. Hmm. You obviously you think they got it wrong, correct? As far as premeditation, I know they got it wrong. Um, some said felony murder. I think that's uh, a very ugly law sitting in my position. 
But as far as the way the law is written, I think I can understand how some reach that conclusion. So what's your message to the jury right now? Well, I don't know that I have a direct message for the jury. I know that um, I prayed constantly for every single one of them. So that's the jury that was brought to me. That's the jury that I was meant to have. So you, you prayed for the jury? I prayed prior to trial that the right jurors would, would be on my, on my jury. So um, I just have to believe that those were the right jurors. And the last question I have is going back to when you were on the stand and Juan Martinez was cross-examining you. It was really tense. It felt like you were giving back as much as he was giving. What was going through your mind? What really did you want to say had um, there been no constraints in what to say at that point? I would have said a lot more. Um, you want to say it now? Well, I can't. I would have to think back to a specific incident. Well, you told him he was scrambling your brain because he was yelling at you. I yeah. Yeah. Um, what were you thinking when he was yelling at you? Um, I probably shouldn't say. There were a lot of times when he was beating up on other witnesses, more like attacking the messenger rather than the message, and I just wanted to be able to uh, jump into their body and respond for them, just because I feel like he is um, a bully. I actually kind of expected you, when he would go after you like that, to, to shrink away or cry or be like, wait, but instead you, you did stand up to him. Yeah, that? I think that if um, it had been any sooner than, trial did take a long time to finally get here. If it had been any sooner, I would have melted. I would have just fallen apart. Um, but my confidence came on the stand knowing that I'm, I'm up there and I'm ready to speak the truth. And I know that I was, I know what happened. And that gave me a sense of inner strength to handle him. He can throw whatever curveballs he wants. I know what, th I know what happened. And I'll answer it. What are you going to do tomorrow? I have court. Um, I don't know. What's tonight going to be like? I'm hoping... Knowing, knowing now the decision, what's, how is tonight going to be different than every night leading up to today? Um, well, I thought a lot about that, and um, I had a list of things that I wanted to do with my life if I were blessed with a second chance. So there are still things on that list I might be able to accomplish regardless. Um, but tonight I was going to go back and visit with my family and um, break the news to my friends who have been very supportive. And just business as usual tonight, and then we'll see what tomorrow brings. I was going to try to show you what your Twitter page looks like, but we have no service down here. Yeah. Here's what the home page looks like. That's my home page. So yours is you know, a shot of you in court. Yeah. And then down below is a whole bunch of the groupings of what you write. So you only get 140 okay. characters. Okay. And then you're able to uh, direct message here. That's how Donovan was able to get in touch with me a couple of times. I see. So um, if you ever need to get in touch with me again, you've got my number. And Donovan can all obviously get through and okay. do that there. Thank you. Um, stay in touch. And, uh, I don't know what I can do for you on the outside. You know yeah. a lot for me. Yeah. I said, you know, today. And I respect the fact. Well, I, I read when you gave me your card, your that postcard kind yes. of thing, that you said you have daughters. I do. And I don't know how old they are, but. 11 and uh, 14. Yeah. I just, I mean, I'm sure you're a great dad. I don't know you, but um, I guess I just would just, daughters are really fragile as far as. It's just, it's, um, it's so common that they tend to choose, well, I mean, at 14 it's a little different, but it's, it's common that they will choose men very similar to the kind that raised them. Yeah. 
and that's why I'm trying to reassure my wife because yeah. I am a good guy. Yeah. I can back me up on that. Lisa probably a little bit. I don't know if you want to ask her. I don't mean that. Um, I don't mean that to be a reflection on my no, own no. dad. I mean he's done the best he can. Your dad has. Yes. He wasn't there very much. He's, he's got health issues, correct? Yeah, he has a lot of health issues. Is he coming? Is he going to come down to visit you? Think? I believe he will. Do you talk to him on the phone? Yes. What kinds of things if you want to share? What has he told you? Um, his thoughts and his feelings. He um, he really wanted to interview with Fox because he likes that network the most. Um, Would other... you allow him to do that now? Um, I don't know. Um, it's really up to him. So we haven't talked about it much. Thank you. Do you know what time it is? What time it is? Yeah. It's uh, 20 after 3. Okay. Thanks. You guys are rolling, right? 